John Cullen with GrowingYourGreens.com through another exciting episode for him here on location in Los Angeles, California. Um, actually, it's almost the end of the year and where I'm at today is I'm at a residential house that is a farm. And I met this farmer actually at a local farmer's market that I attend when I'm down in town visiting. Um, I seen him at the Torrance Farmer's Market, but I think he does five other markets or five total markets here in the area. And I'm like, he's like, hey, John, I got started because of you, man. And I'm like, cool, man. I want to check out your setup. So he invited me over to share with you guys his farm. And the amazing thing about this farmer is that he doesn't have five acres. He doesn't have 200 acres. He doesn't even have an acre. <laughs> Everything he grows and he sells is in basically a two-car garage. So I want to let you guys know that if you guys want to be a farmer, you can. If you guys got a two-car, even a one-car garage, you could start growing the microgreens like he is here today. And the cool thing about John is that he uses paper towels to grow the microgreens. I've, I've, I mean, I've heard of this before, but he does this commercially. So let's check out how he grows his microgreens on paper towels here in Los Angeles at Holistic Microgreens. All right, so now I wanna give you guys a hand cam shot around this farm, which is really just a two car garage at present time. So Holistic Microgreens there, you could check them out at holisticoperations.com at ho.listic on Instagram. Let's check it out. Come on in. All right, so this is the farm. Basically what you're seeing is just these racks that you could buy at Costco, <laughs> filled with bootstrap farmer trays that you can see a whole supply up there, and some lights. I mean, that's what this farm is. Growing microgreens, guys, is not rocket science. You know, he uses these uh, grow lights just from Amazon. These are just like T5 lights, like just utility lights. So that you don't even need special grow lights, guys. If you want to dial it in, of course, you can get the grow lights. Maybe they're gonna go better, but he could have a crop done and he has them in all different stages right now. And I'll, I'll run you guys through the process. It takes maybe 10 to 12 days on average to grow a crop of microgreens. So let's go ahead and run you through the process on how to grow microgreens yourself if you've never done it before and check it out. The coolest thing is these are all being grown on paper towels simply and easily. No reason or need to buy the messy coconut core or other pads that a lot of people will try to sell you. That being said, what I will tell you is that, you know, every different growing medium, and in this case he's using paper towels, will work for certain seeds. Some seeds will just never grow on paper towels, but as you guys can see, a lot of the seeds he grows on paper towels. Now there's even something even cooler than growing on paper towels, which is his sunflower greens. His sunflower greens, he grows them on no paper towels. On nothing. <laughs> on nothing. So there's basically, these are just being grown by nothing. You guys can see underneath there, they're just being grown on the trays and the, the roots are wrapping around the trays there. Look at that, the roots are coming out of the bottom of the bootstrap farmer trays. So yeah, growing, growing on nothing and he's getting some really nice germination on his sunflower greens and he's doing a little bit different than most microgreens farmers I've seen before. So next I wanna show you guys actually how he germinates his seeds and gets them growing on these trays. All right guys, so now I wanna show with you guys how to grow microgreens according to holistic microgreens here. They have their own process that they've kind of came up with. The farmer's a former engineer so he like tries to like dial in every little component and make it exactly perfect. Now the first thing he did was really cool is he's using paper towels. Yes, he is using tree-free paper towels by Grove Co. 100% sustainably grown bamboo, pesticide-free, plastic-free, strong absorbent, sustainable, no added dyes, inks, or scents. And he just gets this from the Grove Company. These are the paper towels that he uses and two million acres closer to a sustainable future, I encourage you guys to get away from using paper products. So this is bamboo paper towels right here. We'll show you guys how to use them. Actually, I wipe my butt with bamboo bagasse, which is sugarcane fiber um, toilet paper myself, in addition to using a bidet, and I encourage you guys to go that direction. 
definitely gets you a lot cleaner. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so yeah, you got to have the medium, right, to grow them on, which are the paper towels. Here's one I'll be showing you guys how to use them. The next thing you'll need, you'll need some good trays. So they could, you could buy a standard 10 by 20 trays at a local nursery and pop holes in them. But, you know, I want you guys to do it right. These trays are the best trays out there. These are the bootstrap farmer trays. Now, I'm not going to say these are cheap because they're not, but these things are durable. They're going to last you. You want the trays that have the holes in it. For This is where you plant the microgreens. And then you have a bottom tray that will hold the water. So this way, when the microgreens are growing, you're going to basically just put water on this bottom tray uh, so you could bottom water so you're not going to have these mold issues and things that you're going to get if you top water. The other thing you guys need to use some good quality seeds. So he uses the True Leaf Market high grade premium seeds. Um, here he has a whole bunch of different kinds, radishes and um, sunflowers and broccoli and different mixes that he'll be uh, growing in a microgreen, so you'll need that. So the other thing you need to do is you need to weigh out your seeds. So he's a little scale here, and he's weighed out some uh, arugula seeds, and depending on what seeds you're going to be growing, you're going to need to weigh out the seeds. So in this case, we have 12 grams. In the case of radish seeds, because they're larger, you may need like 30 grams, but it doesn't take a lot of seeds to grow a whole flat of microgreens. That's why the microgreens business, if you guys are selling them, you could make a lot of money because you know the seeds are pretty cheap. It takes some of your labor, and then microgreens. I don't know if you guys price microgreens lately, but microgreens are sold by the ounce, kind of like some other things that are sold by the ounce, not sold by the pound, and they're quite expensive per ounce. So just a few seeds grows a lots of microgreens that you could really cash in on. The other crop John is thinking about expanding into is the mushrooms. So mushrooms and microgreens are two crops you could literally grow in the garage here and have you know, high value um, you know, crops to sell to local people. So yeah, so anyways, he takes the seeds, this is a reused cup, and then he has a special seed distribution uh, system that's not patented, so I want you guys to copy it. <laughs> he basically has a sriracha bottle <laughs> that he has a proprietary top. It's basically just their top. He cut, a, he cut it off a little bit to have it the right size. And he basically will take the seeds Put it in the shiracha bottle to like fold this so he doesn't lose any seeds. And then he'll put the top on it. And this is his seed dispersal mechanism. <laughs> so that's cool. Alright, so what you're going to do here is you're going to basically take the paper towels that are made out of bamboo. And you're going to unroll like four sheets. So once you've got four sheets unrolled, you're going to put it on the bootstrap farmer tray and you're going to align one corner. Then what you're going to do is you're going to carefully go ahead and fold it at the seam because you just want a flat piece of paper towel. Then you're just going to fold it over so it goes all the way to the edge. And then you're just going to fold this layer over as well. And that's how it looks now. The next thing you're doing is you're going to take a, basically a sprayer. So you, we pump this up and now this is just straight uh, water and we're just going to wet this down. This is going to basically make the base of where the seeds are going to germinate because it's nice and wet for them, simulating like them being underneath soil. And then once you got all this sprayed down, not too wet, then you see I got all these lumps. We want to get out the lumps, guys. We want to make it completely flat. So we got to kind of like get all these air bubbles out so we have a nice flat paper towel in the bottom of this tray. All right, close enough for government work. Now the next thing is you have your seed dispersal device. And this gets a pretty precision, guys. You go down and you basically just shake it a little bit. And as you shake it, you move it around. And you got to get the right technique, but this allows you to basically um, disperse them fairly evenly, a lot better than if I just sprinkle them down, as all I've seen a lot of microgreens farmers do. I'm actually getting a pro layering effect of like a single layer evenly dispersed. This is actually working quite well for me. Then we want to make sure we go around the edges, make sure the edges are filled in. I think I missed a little bit in the middle. Go back to the middle here. 
We're going to look for some areas where I didn't get enough seeds. Man, this is working really good. Everybody should buy some sriracha and then cut off the top. <laughs> Works. This works super good. I'm really impressed. Like, so he really tries to reuse a lot of things. So, like, he composts these flats when they're done, and we'll show you guys the whole process. But yeah, this is working really good to get the best distribution I've ever gotten when I've grown microgreens. So he's he should maybe patent this and <laughs> have a holistic seed spreader, which is basically sriracha bottles. All right. So once you got all the seed spread out, then here's the next difficult part. Actually, it's really easy. You're going to once again take that sprayer and then spray it down again. You don't want to drench them, you don't want to like leave them in water, but you just want to wet them down just enough. And if you wet them down too much, you're going to move them because the water spray is going to move the seeds. <laughs> so don't do it. Now the next step is, as you guys can see, he's got all these trays in the back. These aren't just trays stacking here, these are trays actually currently growing that he started a few days ago. So what we want to do now is we want to cover these because now this is like the ground and now we need to basically put them under the ground. They don't want to sprout if they can see the light. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a full tray here and we're just going to cover them. And then he has basically over here, if you guys can see, he's got these heat mats down here that he uses certain times of the year to get better germination and he'll basically just make stacks. So we could just uh, put this uh, whole setup here right over here. And then every day he's going to check this, you know, and make sure there's still moisture in there. Some days he'll water, some days he won't. And in general, um, the, the standard seeds like arugula, broccoli, um, and things that he does, it'll be in this area for three days, totally trying to find the light. So at this point, the sprouts are starting to sprout, and they're starting to push up the tray. He doesn't even put any kind of weight on this or anything. And then once they're after, after three days, they're doing pretty good. He'll move them over to the, you know, the racks and just uncover them and leave them uncovered for the rest of their life, which is going to be from about 10 to 12 days to a full harvest term. So he could get multiple croppings in for one year. Now, the other thing I want to show you guys real quick is how he does his sunflower greens. So his trick for sunflower greens is unlike you know, just spreading the sunflower greens out, he'll basically put these in a mason jar and he'll soak these like overnight and then he'll basically just uh, rinse them every single day for about five days. I think this is a couple days in, you guys can see there's already tails uh, starting to grow, but he wants to get some of the roots starting to form. So after these have been growing in the jar for about five days, he'll then spread them on the tray and then he'll cover these and uh, he'll put a brick on them. Sometimes he'll use a brick and sometimes he won't, but definitely for sunflowers, you kind of need to push them in, especially because he's not using kind of the paper towel on there. He'll leave them under this area for five days. They'll start to push up and that's when he moves them into the racks with the grow lights. So, I mean, as you guys can see, guys, this is not rocket science. But John is out here seriously every single day. He can't really even go on vacation because if he doesn't do his microgreens and you know starting them and watering them, they're they're gonna not make it. So that's like my big thing. That's why I don't grow microgreens currently because it's a lot of work. You you got to show up every day. Like my plants that I grow in my garden. Hey, I plant them once at the beginning of the season. My automatic irrigation comes on. I check them like a couple times a week, and then basically I go out there and harvest them. Right? He's providing the light. He's providing the water. He's doing everything to literally baby these microgreens to get them to grow up into nice sized microgreens that he will then cut fresh in front of uh, his customers at the farmer's market. So I really appreciate that he's actually cutting them and harvesting them fresh in front of the customers so that they know they're going to get the highest quality product. He's not a microgreens farm that will cut everything in advance and then sell it. The problem with cutting everything in advance and then selling it is that the product will degrade and not last as long because it's already been pre-cut and it's starting to age because it's no longer connected to source, to the roots and no longer living. Furthermore, if he doesn't sell you know, a crop one day because he's all still living, he could take it to the next day to the next farmer's market so he has less shrink or less loss. So this way he can maximize his profits and provide his customers the highest quality microgreens that many other farms in the area may not be doing, unfortunately. So now I want to show you guys a journey on the racks of what the uh, microgreens look like as they go through the different stages. So you guys can see 
We just did a tray. These ones are maybe done about three days ago. They're almost ready to go out on a rack. I want to show you guys some that were just put on the rack this morning so you guys can see how uh, how much how much growth they've had. And then we're, and then we're going to show you guys a couple different stages and show you guys the journey they go through from growing to be small to bigger to the harvestable size at the market. All right, so you guys can see he put these under the lights literally this morning and there's uh, he bought them water them so you don't want to tip them too much. And you guys can see they're not yet greening up. They're still kind of like yellow. But then if you look at this tray, he put these out just like literally yesterday. You guys can see the clear difference. Look at these. These are starting to green up. They're starting to reach for the light. That's what plants do. They want to reach for the light. And the light cycle he uses, he uses 16 on and 8 off. So he has a nice long light cycle. More light, the better to a point but your plants also need uh, the dark time so that they can go to sleep like we need to sleep sleep is so important for us guys like even if you eat the most crappy diet if you get good sleep you can be quite healthy <laughs> but you should still eat healthy but nonetheless the plants would stress out if they had too much light and you force too much growth so i really love his 16-8 uh, light cycle it's pretty optimal and he took a week off for the you know christmas holiday so he, he doesn't have any like uh, you know three day or four day old but now we could jump up to the 12 day harvest which is what he was supposed to sell today at the farmer's market which is about finished now actually so we have some nice crop that we could be harvesting and he could be selling and then i'll show you guys actually how it looks like how it's rooted in to the paper towels so here's the cool thing about microgreens guys, like normally they're done in about uh, 10 to 12 days, 10 days in the summertime, uh, maybe 12 days in the wintertime when it's a bit colder here in the garage. And this whole tray retails, he'll sell for about 30 bucks guys. Look at that, nice microgreens there. These have to be the red uh, cabbage microgreens so they have a nice dark pigment. I wanna encourage you guys when you guys grow or even buy or eat microgreens, Try to get ones that have a red tinge. That's a sign of the anthocyanin content. And that makes the microgreens like boosted up on steroids even more nutritious for you. It is said that microgreens are four to 40 times more nutritious than the full size vegetables. Unlike other YouTube channels that say, oh, like I went to this stupid farmer's market the other day in Vegas and the guys like tell me, oh, this is four to 40 times more nutritious than vegetables. So then I asked him, I'm like, so, does that mean you're telling me I could eat like, you know, 40 times less vegetables if I just buy your microgreens? And he's like, yeah, I eat like one little container a day and that's all my vegetables. And I'm like, just thinking in my head, man, that's wrong. Like, he shouldn't be telling people that. Nonetheless, these are quite nutritious. I had microgreens today. I try to get microgreens in whenever I can. And what I will tell you guys is that we should eat all of the different kinds of vegetables. Microgreens, sprouts, full-size vegetables, baby vegetables, they are all good. Each one has their own pros and cons, benefits and drawbacks. The benefits about the microgreens is that they take a lot of work to grow. That's why I'm glad for microgreens farmers that grow them, that do the education to the customers so that they can learn about the power and the benefits of the microgreens and how they're the most supercharged little baby plant money can buy. Meanwhile, the same time if you guys want to start a microgreens farm, once again, I said he, he sells this for about 30 bucks. How much materials does he have in this? Well, he has approximately three dollars of materials in this. Now, yes, it's a lot of time invested too, his, his valuable time, but he does this on scale to grow lots of microgreens. So, you know, it doesn't take that much time, but three bucks turned into 30 bucks, 10 times the money, guys. This is how valuable microgreens can be. So whether you guys want to start your own microgreens farm or whether you want to buy the microgreens to eat yourself, know that they're quite worth it because they are so nutritious for you. So this is the red cabbage, and I want to show you guys the bottom, how this basically just grew through the, through the towel, through the bottom. And now I'm going to lift this up here for you guys. You guys can see here's the towel. We have a nice little sheet, like torn off, of the microgreens on the towel. So currently he cuts and harvests it, uh, fresh for the people in front of them, but I, I, I told them, hey, maybe you should just sell little squares. So that's even taking it to the next level. Because if you cut it off for people in front of them, that's great because it's going to store longer than something that pre-cut it a couple days before or when you buy it at the you know grocery store or whatever. But if you sell it to them on the on the pad still living, they could water it and let it continue to grow. Maybe they could even plant it in their garden if they wanted to. That adds it up to the next level so that his microgreens will stay fresher for longer and provide people even more nutrition 
in the end. And so then down over here we have another Mike Green's. Girl, look at how amazing. This is like his special Sriracha bottle techniques. Look at this. These are nice filled out trays, guys. These are some of the fill, uh, most filled out trays, thickest trays I've seen. I mean, I mean I've been in Mike Green's farms that have like blotchy, that have like, you know, um, dampening off and stuff. Not here, man. He's got his systems down. He's got nice lights. He's got fans going in the background. Good environment to grow these guys. This is the red Russian kale. So the red Russian kale has like a pinkish stem. So once again, that's a sign of anthocyanins. And we're gonna pull this up. Look at this. These are rooted even more in there. And these paper towels are holding nice and firm to hold all the root mass. Uh, it's doing an amazing job. So I'm amazed that he's able to grow nice looking microgreens on literally paper towels. So that reduces, once again, his cost because coconut core costs a lot of money. The different pads that you might buy, whether they're hemp pads, cocoa pads, or jute fat pads, like I visited other farms, they're a lot of money. But hey, bamboo paper towels, one of the cheapest growing mediums you guys could buy to grow the microgreens. I want to show you guys a few more things before we sit down with John Ho, the farmer, and interview him for you guys. I want to show you guys how he waters his microgreens. He takes watering his microgreens to the next level. These are things that I haven't seen at other farms before, so I want to make sure you guys are aware about it. And if you guys are a microgreens farm, we're going to grow microgreens. I want you guys to do some of the practices that he's doing here so you guys could also grow some amazing microgreens. So now I want to show you guys how John takes his watering to the next level, uh, doing practices that many microgreens farmers do not do. Number one, he takes his water and he basically uh, supercharges it with oxygen, so he bubbles his water. This will give his water extra oxygen to feed his plants. In addition, besides that, he'll fill up this tub, which is a 40 gallon tub, with about 38 gallons of water, and then he adds approximately 16 ounces of this stuff right here. This is the extra solid nutritious growing solution. It's known as Ocean Solution 203, and this is an all natural plant nutrient concentrate. What this is, this is ocean minerals, guys, concentrated seawater that will add up to 90 different trace minerals into the water. So then when he feeds this water to his plants, right? the plants will absorb the minerals. When the plants absorb the minerals, right, they put them into their cellular structure so that when his customers eat his microgreens, right, they taste more salty, they taste more sweet because it's these minerals that basically make our taste buds go nuts. And we like the minerally taste. Like, if you go to my garden and pick greens from my garden right now, you're gonna taste like some of the sweetest lettuce and other greens growing because you know not only do I use the trace minerals but it's being grown fresh so he basically will add the ocean solution not a lot this jug this one gallon will last him a long time in here he'll bubble it and then when he's ready to water he'll basically just take this measuring cup he'll dunk it in here and then he's got the water and then he bottom water is very important don't top water your micros guys super critical you could get issues with like mold growth and dampening off if you do that so you're going to bottom water so i'm going to show you guys real quick how to bottom water your microgreens with ocean solution trace mineral charged oxygenated water all right so watering your microgreens could never be easier so once again we've got this supercharged water here you lift up the tray and you want to get an even coating of water on the bottom of the tray you want to make sure you're uh you know you're our racks are completely level and just and then put it down i mean this is how easy growing microgreens is guys you get a sprayer you spray them down a couple times and then from there you can just basically bottom water just lifting the tray up drop a little water make sure you have a nice sheet of water on the bottom and he just does this to every single one and then he just lets the he keeps the lights on once again 16 hours on eight hours off and the microgreens grow. Of course, he uses high quality seeds because if you have you know, junk seeds that don't germinate, it's not gonna work well. So that's why he uses the True Leaf Market Seeds link down below if you guys wanna get the very seeds he does. So John takes it to the next level by after he harvests the, the microgreens fresh for the customer, he comes back to the farm and he has basically the cuttings and the paper towel left. He will compost that 
at the local uh, compost facility so that they could turn that into soil and so that people could continue to grow their gardens and landscape crops locally. So I want to show you guys actually um, his compost um, collection bin where he composts it and does it uh, on site here and then some of it he sends off site when his compost tumblers too full. So the cut microgreens are then put into the compost tumbler so that he could create compost here for his property and feed his fruit trees as well as some of the other ornamental plants he has growing here. I always encourage you guys to have a composter, compost tumbler, compost pile to compost all your excess food scraps and garden waste so that you guys can amend your soil with what you're producing on site and take responsibility for some of the waste that you're generating. And actually, I don't see it as waste. I see it as uh, nutrition and adding nutrients to your fertilizer and basically diverting things that would go to the landfill so that could reduce your garbage bill, but more importantly, end up feeding the earth directly instead of just sending things away, which really ends up going to the landfill and uh, you know polluting the environment. So the overflow of his compost tumbler is full and I'd encourage him to get a larger compost tumbler, a second one to continue to compost here on site. He'll send it off site and the cool thing about his uh, compost uh, that goes off, sent off site here is look at this. Inside, he's, getting, he's sending this away. This looks like good microgreens, guys. But he's got all these cut sheets that definitely are not good to eat. But once again, the paper towels as well as all the little seeds and things are totally compostable. What I might recommend for you guys is to try to find a local farm or you know community garden or other farmers in the area to donate this to because they could just take this and then plant it. Some of the seeds on this mat have not germinated. They could bury this in their garden. This will end up composting in place. Worms will fight it, they'll eat it. And of course, some of these seeds may germinate into full-size plants. So that'd be a better use than just sending these away to get composted is just dig a hole and bury it. All right, the last thing I want to do in this episode is we're going to go ahead and interview John Ho. Yes, that's his name. <laughs> the farmer that started Holistic Microgreens so you can learn more about his operation and why he started this business and why he continues to grow microgreens until this day. So now I have the pleasure of introducing you guys to John Ho. Yes, that is his name with Holistic Microgreens. We're going to learn why he started the microgreens farm, why it's called holistic, and a whole lot more. <laughs> Get it? A whole lot more. Oh, I like that one. A whole lot more. A whole lot more. All right. All right, John. So why did you start holistic microgreens here in your garage? The reason I started growing microgreens, well, it's been a journey, John, to say the least. I used to be an engineer, and then I decided, I guess, fairly quickly, fairly early on, that that's not something I wanted to continue to pursue. So I decided to make a little career change. I was lucky enough to do some consulting over the seas where I worked with some rural farmers in Thailand and kind of saw firsthand how, you know, what goes into growing crops, food production in general. And, you know, prior to that, I never really considered too much about how things really got to our supermarket shelves. I just assumed they get there, that someone grows it, they get there, they don't really think too much about that. And then kind of seeing the inner workings behind the scenes, all the work that goes into it, all the challenges, I really left with the impression that, you know, we got to really revisit or rethink how we do agriculture, especially, you know, we're trying to feed a lot of people. You know, the challenges are, you know, maybe not enough land, not enough water, uh, maybe it's just climate things, climate restrictions. So I came back with the impression that, you know, we are living in an advanced society. There are definitely ways that we can really kind of rethink or maybe revisit how we kind of do some things that we consider so fundamental, things like, you know, food production. So I came back, you know, looked around a little bit, and really did some thinking, and I realized that, you know, food, I'm oh, sorry, water, land, and time are probably the most critical resources to growing food. And if we can find ways to really, I guess, maximize the efficiency with which we use those three resources, that'd probably be a great thing. So then I stumbled upon, you know, hydroponics, using kind of less water or water more efficiently. Also, um, Vertical farming, using less land, I could basically grow like four to five times as much as I could here on these multiple tiers as I could maybe on the ground. And then also microgreens, they grow super quick, you know, 10 to 12 days like John said earlier. So if I can use less land, less water, less time to grow good quality food, and really I think it's a thing that maybe more, and things that more, maybe more of us can really kind of do or maybe uh, 
kind of be conscious of, I guess. Wow, so to me it sounds like you saw how industry was doing it on massive scale and all the inefficiencies of industry on how food has to travel lots of food miles and how you could grow something really nutritious, right, locally for people, uh, you know, with the least amount of water, reusing a lot of different products, you know, including all the different trays and whatnot, recycling the waste, using very little seeds, right, and then actually generating some good income for yourself at the same time, but then providing local people higher quality food, you know, grown locally, harvested right in front of them, right? Unlike, that's totally the opposite of the industrial agriculture system. Is that right? That is exactly right. You articulated it much more clearly and much better than I could have. Thank you for that, John. Thank you. You're welcome. So why did you call your microgreens farm holistic, with the H-O dot listic, microgreens? Uh, well, I, my last name is Ho, so I wanted to add a little personal flair to the whole thing, I guess. You know, maybe something more that kind of encompasses my mentality, my view, my beliefs, and into my little lifestyle, a little business here. So a little, uh, a little personal flair. So what, is, what does holistic mean, just the nor normal word, and how do you integrate that into the, the microgreens? Being That's a holistic? good question. Thank you for asking the question. Holistic typically refers to kind of having a multifaceted approach, mm -hmm. kind of touching on maybe multi a multi-dimensional approach and I guess the way I incorporate that here I try to reuse things wherever I can as John demonstrated earlier uh, repurpose sriracha bottle into now a proprietary patent pending uh, seed distributor I think he's kidding uh, yeah, yeah. we'll see you in a few years though check back in, uh, next year um, and also just trying to find ways to minimize the waste by using bamboo paper towels bamboos are highly um, you know they grow very quickly very sustainable versus you know trying to get not not to knock on soil but, or cook a quark, but you know not as renewable as say something like bamboo so try to really kind of cover all the bases I use plant-based uh, plastics for my packaging as well PLAs um, energy efficient lighting uh, and just try to be kind of cognizant of where what my inputs are and how to kind of really make sure that they're kind of in line with what I'm trying to do here which is maybe give back a little value without extracting so much, as I think John does here as well. <laughs> yeah. So how long have you been growing the microgreens, John? I've been growing microgreens for about two and a half years. So it kind of started like during COVID and it really, really kind of just noticed that this is crazy. They not only do they look good, they taste good. I could grow them really anywhere. And it really just took off from there. Cool. And what has been, what has been the biggest challenge for you getting your farm established? Oh, there's been a few. I guess the one, I guess, biggest challenge was obviously the learning curve coming from an engineering background, not really dealing with plants too much. That kind of took a little bit of uh, some time to figure out how do I want to grow them, what conditions do the plants like, what changes can I make, and how should I make those changes. Um, what else is there? Uh, challenges would be uh, probably uh, first is marketing and kind of setting up a clientele, right? You're kind of a brand new player in, in, a, in a market. You gotta, like any other business, kind of identify what your clientele is, what do they want, what are their needs, what are their desires, and then really kind of engage with the community and go from there. Um, the challenge, another challenge also is probably the amount of work that these guys, these little guys take. They're micro greens, but there's macro work involved, a lot of work involved. So I don't have a lot of time to take off, but you know, this, uh, my little babies here keep me going and keep me motivated. So it's definitely a challenge sometimes to find a, wake up in the morning, you know, it's still cold out to go check the plants, but then, you know, I'm also in the, of the, the mentality or mindset that I do kind of provide value to my community, so that kind of also keeps me going as well. And of course, just your connection with nature, you know, I mean, these guys, are, this is nature right in front of you, like, you grow more plants than I do, because <laughs> you have thousands of little babies that you have to manage, and I, I couldn't manage all these thousands of babies. I couldn't do it. I'll, I'll handle the bigger grown-up plants it's a lot easier <laughs> leave the babies to me you know? I'll leave the babies to him <laughs> all right so John so how many markets did you get into and was it hard to get into farmers markets oh that's a good question another challenge that I ran into also was maybe waiting a little too long or not doing enough market research on what markets I wanted to do and uh, so in that in kind of lacking in that area maybe another vendor of my green grower had gotten into another good market that I wanted to get into so then I would have to be relegated to maybe a smaller market where maybe the uh, clientele or the, the sales weren't quite as uh, there. But you know, you can find, always find your way and find your niche into a community and you know, kind of work your way up from there. Uh, I do five markets a week. 
I do, um, they're all in the South Bay of Los Angeles, but that's where I grew up. But the five markets I do are um, Redondo Beach on Thursdays, Fridays Hermosa Beach, Saturdays Torrance where I met John, yep. Sundays Palos Verdes, that's where I grew up with the high school. The market is literally uh, in the parking lot right with the school. And my booth is set up where I used to park my car in high school. So I think that's kind of a little, uh, a little, uh, uh, you know, foresight there maybe, who knows. And then um, Tuesday, I'm also back at Torrance as well. So five days a week. The other Tuesdays, I'm not at market, still working, growing, cleaning, all the other stuff behind the scenes. So, so you, before, as your job as an engineer, I'm sure engineers make a ton of money. What percentage money difference are you making now as a microgreens farmer versus an engineer? Now, I would say probably about 75%. But when I first started, there was definitely a, a pretty noticeable dip. So for anyone thinking about jumping ship into, into this field, make sure you have your, uh, your plan A solidified and maybe plan B can come after that. But make sure you have your stuff, your bases all, your I's dotted, your T's crossed, because there will probably be a little bit of a transitionary phase when you first transition, but if you're willing to stick in the work and uh, make things work, you can, uh, you can find yourself getting back to what you're making, if not more. So this year I anticipate to surpass what I was making before. Wow, Hopefully. great, after just a few years. Yeah. Wonderful. So, I mean, here's the thing, guys, like, you know, you shouldn't get into farming if you just have big dollar signs in front of you because it is a lot of work, right? But you should do it because you have something else that motivates you. You know, John's motivation is to be more sustainable on the planet and get the highest quality crops out to people. He's taken some of my suggestions I've given him over the years that I've seen him at Farmer's Market to implement into his farm here. I've given him a lot more suggestions today that I hope he, you know, makes in the future to improve the quality of his crops and what he's providing to the local people, right? So you, you got to have more than just the money because, you know, it, it's so important, you know, don't just get fixed on the money because money will mess you up. <laughs> That's what I'll say. But nonetheless, as you can see, after just a few years, he's making what, it, what, it, what he would as an engineering job without all the stress of an in, a high pressure engineering job by having his own free time. Yes, he has a commitment to the plants he has to do but he has a lot more free time to do what, what he wants, you know, uh, than just staying at a job for money he, he, he needs, but he, but he hates his job, right? So, I mean, I think that's the, the freedom of owning your own business. I mean, I'm a, my own business owner as well for as long as I can remember. Um, and I'd encourage you guys to start your own business also. Uh, so, John, let's get into the technical aspects of growing microgreens, you know, I'm sure you just didn't start growing on bamboo paper towels one day. I'm sure you went through a lot of different growing mediums. So tell us about, you know, how you ended up on the bamboo paper towels and what growing mediums you've used in the past and what were your experiences? Uh, I think uh, like most, I guess, commercial microgreen growers, we've kind of gone through several phases with different phases and I've pretty much used every uh, medium out there, soil, coco coir, different types of hydrop hydroponic mats. And I guess I first started with soil because that kind of seemed just the most intuitive. My right? plants grown soil is probably the way to go. And what I noticed also is that, or I guess one of the some of the downsides or the challenges were that some of the customers, some of the people would complain that why are my greens so dirty? Uh, and now I just tell them, well, they're grown in soil. I don't know how to make them undirty. Besides, you know, uh, maybe washing them before I bring them to the market, but then they're all wet, so that doesn't really work out either. And also another challenge was that the trays, when they're full of soil and also saturated, they get quite heavy. So I actually, as durable as the bootstrap farmer trays are, I end up breaking trays over time. Wow. So then I started thinking that maybe there's got to be a way to kind of not only lessen the volume of the waste that I'm trying to compost or get rid of, but also just the overall bulk density of it as well. Mm. So then I switched over to coco coir. Coco coir was good, but just very messy and kind of, kind of tedious to work with. You gotta take the brick, you gotta hydrate the brick, you gotta break it up, mix it up. Kind of got over that fairly quickly. And then um, I started doing hydroponic grow mats and those just were too expensive to make it really make sense. And then a so light bulb went off in my mind that whenever I used to grow up plants back in the day, I would germinate them in paper towels first and put them in a Ziploc bag, put them in a dark space. Sometimes I forget about the seeds, come back and they'd grown to like maybe like six, seven inches in the bag. And I was like, okay, maybe there's something here that maybe they can actually grow on a paper towel. Because since these hydroponic mediums are really just synthetic fibers or maybe you know, natural fibers, their main function is just to kind of really hold their anchor the roots. So then I really just started experimenting with paper towels. Can I really do a full growth cycle with these? 
did a few trial runs, found that they actually do work fairly well. You just have to make certain adjustments here, maybe be more mindful of the watering, be more mindful of uh, you know, planting densities. But once you kind of figure out what works for you, with the planting, how many, how many grams of seeds you want to use, it's pretty straightforward. You just got to be more vigilant about watering, especially if it's hot out. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've noticed that they, most seeds will grow just as well on paper towels. Obviously certain ones that John mentioned earlier, maybe things like beets, or um, you know, sunflower seeds don't grow as well on the bamboo paper, but for the most part, they do just as well. Cool. Yeah. No, these look amazing, guys. Like seriously, I've been to a bunch of microgreens farms. Like I, I would probably rather go with the bamboo paper towels over like a coconut cork, because as you said, it's all messy and just gets everywhere. And also, too, the customers don't like the little particles on their microgreens. Like I really hate that when I get micros that have you know particulate on them. So. John, what micros do you grow here on the bamboo that are the top three easiest? Top three easiest. Good question, John. Thank you for that. Yes, I would say sir. top three easiest would be probably any of your brassicas, really. So broccoli for sure. Red cabbage, kales are easy. Um, radishes grow really pretty well too. Actually, really well. Um, mustards as well, like mazuna or like wasabi mustards. Um, Arugula grows well too. Arugula is, in, in, I guess, in general, more tricky growth. Kind of more tend to um, more prone to things like you know mold growth mm -hmm. and more disease. So you kind of have to be more vigilant with the arugula. But they do grow well as well. Um, I do. I grow bok choy as well with, with good success. And amaranth grows well as well. Surprisingly, I didn't think amaranth would, would do well, but it does really good. And so does things like cress. Uh, certain mucilaginous seeds, maybe we have to be a little more careful because they do kind of have that little outer layer of, uh, I guess, is that mucus in a way? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So those ones you do have to be maybe a little more careful, but you know, uh, for the most part, most grains do pretty well. Things like maybe beets, kind of your hardier seeds, like pea sprouts don't do that well in paper towels either. Um, yeah, most of them do pretty well. My top three would probably be broccoli, kale, and red cabbage for sure. And mustard, if I had to put four in the top three. <laughs> yeah, and I'd encourage you guys to grow some of those because those are some of the most nutritious uh, leafy greens or even microgreens you guys could eat. They're like have anti-cancer properties, anti-aging properties, definitely good for you and easy to grow. Exactly. Anti-aging, as you can see on our skin here. <laughs> so another question I have for you, John, is what difference did adding the ocean solution trace minerals make to your grow? What have you noticed? And how long have you been doing it? Um, that's a good question. I've been doing that almost since from the beginning. So when I first started, I was just using normal water. And uh, since I adopted or implemented the ocean solutions trace minerals, definitely more vibrant colors, better taste, and just better general overall growth as well. Before, just using water, very slow growth. Colors that looked, didn't seem to pop as much. The flavor was there, but kind of muted. So once you started, at, once I started adding trace minerals, I really saw this overall increase in every regard, whether it be you know, visual, aesthetics, taste-wise, and just overall quality of just the green as well. So you, would you recommend that other growers use it as well? One thousand percent. And if Ocean Solutions are hearing this. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> hey, link down below to my video on Ocean Solutions. I think I probably have some kind of discount code in there. I actually interviewed the president of Ocean Solution Company many years ago. So tell me about the lights you guys are using here, John, because I mean, you just got some cheap lights from Amazon. They're just whatever lights are not even any kind of official grow light and you're still growing some amazing microgreens. Yeah, they're normal LED T5s, bottom of Amazon. I think they came in a pack of eight. So basically, Eight lights per 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 rack, basically. Is so, yeah, one pack. And how much exactly. are they? Uh, a pack of eight. I think I bought them for like sixty to like seventy dollars. Wow. Yeah, they're not specialized at all. They do they do great, but maybe that's something I won't revisit this year. Maybe get some more specialized, focused lights uh, specifically for growing. But as of now, they seem to do just fine. And for anyone looking to get into bucket greens, I think it's a good start, good starting place. Yeah, I mean, she, I mean, any lights will work, guys. You don't need like special lights. That being said, you know, once you get into more advanced growing, there's all kinds of published studies that I've reviewed where they show different nanometers of light will produce different nutrients in the plants. But that's like toy next level. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> For another video. Yeah, it's another video once he once he experiments with that more. So, John, another question I want to ask you is, what about the humidity and temperature here in your garage? Do you monitor that? I know some people, you know, monitor their humidity levels and make sure they have the right temperature. 
But what are your thoughts on this, and what do you do here? Well, I do in Southern California, once again. There we go. Important caveat. Um, I do think temperature and humidity do make a big difference depending on where you grow. But fortunately, being here in Southern California, temperatures are fairly mild. Humidity is is pretty stable, so I don't have to worry too much about that. But obviously, in the summer months when it does get hot, I do have a, an AC unit in here. I'm thinking about maybe getting a mini, investing in a mini split to really get the temperature and humidity dialed. But so far. I just have to really be mindful about maybe improving air, I mean not improving, but getting good airflow over the greens, especially when it's hot out. Um, in terms of humidity, when it's humid, maybe get a dehumidifier, but I haven't had too many um, problems personally. Maybe I'm blessed because of you know being in so SoCal. But I'm sure in other climates, you definitely would be have to be more mindful about temperature and humidity, for sure. And then what about air circulation? I know you have a couple of fans that didn't show those in the episode, but you want to talk about how important air circulation is? Air circulation is incredibly important. Uh, I guess one of the big challenges for microgreens that I kind of skipped earlier is that um, you, they can be kind of prone to mold. Because they are planted so densely and they are kind of, you know, oftentimes do be uh, are moist, airflow is a, a very important aspect to have in your microgreen grow. You definitely want to have good air circulation, good fresh air exchange, to keep, uh, you know, you don't want stagnant air. Stagnant air will definitely invite things like mold and other disease into your grow area. So air circulation is a must. Cool, so talking about diseases, you know, I know some farmers will they basically use hydrogen peroxide, you know, and do a hydrogen peroxide soak on their seeds or even add it to the water as they water. Do you guys, do you use any hydrogen peroxide? Uh, I used to sometimes. Uh, I, I use it rarely, um, but it is a very good, uh, like John said, a good, uh, I guess, mitigation measure for things like disease and mold. I guess a good food grade, uh, you could buy 12%, right, that would be down to 3%. Something that's not too strong, that's not going to, you know, affect the greens too much, but be good enough and strong enough to really affect any kind of pathogens or disease you may have. So that's definitely something to look into if you have, you know, problems with, with mold or other disease, for sure. So why don't you use it? Uh, because I don't have problems with disease and mold currently. <laughs> I think I've gotten things down to a pretty good science where I can kind of avoid them. Mm -hmm. I was having problems with mold when I was, during my blackout phase, so I kind of skipped blackout entirely because I would notice that as soon as I put them in the blackout, the next day there'd be a ball of mold in there. So uh, that could have been maybe due to my sanitation or uh, other things that maybe I could have controlled better, but I realized that if I skipped the blackout, I wouldn't have the mold problem. So then I can also circumvent the whole um, hydrogen peroxide as well. So no blackout, go straight from germination to the lights. You don't have any problems with mold. So no um, hydrogen peroxide for me. Wow, yeah, and once again, saving money, saving costs, and you know, once again, dialing in how he's growing. I mean, this is a, this is a master craftsman microgreens grower because he does it every single, you know, precisely the amount with his engineering background in mind, he does it perfectly so that he doesn't have these issues. So you want to talk about the seeds, John. I mean, I talked about it a little bit, but you want to talk about how important having high quality seeds, because I'm sure you've gotten bad batches of seeds from different places and whatnot, and what seeds you use now and, you know, what experience you've had with seeds. Yeah, that's another big contributor to things like disease and mold. If you get a batch of contaminated seeds, you're just tossed the whole grow, it's done. There's no point in trying to save it. If you have bad batch of seeds, it can be like, it can be very frustrating. You know, I spent a good amount of money on a big old bag of seeds, turns out the whole bag of seeds is bad. So you definitely do want to take time to invest in good seeds from the beginning. So the seeds that I go to, or that I get my seeds from, are um, True Leaf Market and Johnny Seeds as well. Um, they tend to, uh, at least in my experience, have some of the best quality of seeds and also best variety as well. Good organic varieties, good heirloom varieties, non-GMO of course. So good quality seeds like John said are, um, are a must for sure. So another thing that's a really important component of growing microgreens are the trays. I mean people can cheap out and get those cheap 10 by 20 trays that disintegrate after a couple uses. But you want to tell us more about your experiences using different trays and why you set it on the bootstrap farmer trays. Well, uh, like, uh, like many things in life, it's a journey, right? So I started off using the flimsy ones. They were cheap, and I thought this would be, you know, maybe uh, how bad can they be? You know, they can't be that weak. And then maybe after your first use, they're already cracked, and maybe you already, as soon as they're shipped to you, you open the box, they're already cracked. So I really learned early on that investing in good trays will go a long, a long ways. Because I've used pretty much these same trays for maybe the whole entire two and a half, two years that I've been growing. Because the other ones, you know, when I first started, just didn't even last more than one growth cycle oftentimes, especially when I was using soil. Those were just breaking left and right. 
and instead of having you know a garage full of microgreens, I was having a trash can full of broken trays. And I realized that you know, it's probably a good time to get invest in good trays. And Bootstrap seemed to have the best options or is the is best reputation in terms of seeds that I saw at the time. So I went with them, and I've been with them ever since, and have had uh, no regrets. No, not looking back at all. All right, so getting down to the business aspects of your farm, John. So do you sell um, mostly retail or wholesale, and what's your what's your goal on you know the selling? Because hey, growing is great. He's got that dialed in, but the selling is especially the difficult part. Because even if you're a good grower, doesn't mean you're a good salesman. That is very true. And uh, to piggyback off what John said, I've sold prosciutto to a rabbi. So you know, to speak, <laughs> I have not. That's not true. That is not true. Um, the sales aspect um, definitely. You know, I currently primarily am in the retail space. I do want to expand this year into some of the wholesale, possibly, but maybe more of a, subscri a subscription-based model like John and I discussed off-camera earlier. Um, but yeah, one of the challenges for sure is definitely establishing that clientele early on and uh, obviously having the consistent product that people can rely on too. But yeah, mainly restaurants and farmers markets. I do five farmers markets a week, like I said earlier, and several restaurants around the area, coffee shops. Um, it's also a good idea to bring some of your sample products to your local businesses or local restaurants to see, you know, if there's a market there for you guys too. Cool. So where do you see your microgreens business going in like, you know, five years? Where do you see it being? Are you going to have a warehouse building? You're just going to, you know, build your garage bigger, have more? Are you just going to kind of be like, oh, I got my microgreens business stable. I'm making more now than I was as an engineer and I just love what I'm doing. I'm, I don't want to grow much more. Five years down the road, that's a good question. I think there are many avenues uh, for me. Uh, one, maybe five years, I know John has a Tesla now, maybe following in the footsteps of Elon, we can terraform <laughs> Mars, and then maybe have microgreens <laughs> growing on Mars, maybe. That's one avenue, maybe, in the future. Um, but definitely, for sure, if, I, if we're sticking to the Earth, you know, probably have, maybe, for sure, a warehouse space, mm. expand the garage also. Um, I think my next bet probably would be a warehouse space. So wow, so you space. do want to get a lot larger. Uh, ideally, yeah. And then obviously try to find uh, maybe passionate people about growing things. They hire, hire some more employees to expand that way. Get people inspired to grow for their own, for themselves. Uh, but yeah, warehouse, warehouse space for sure. Wow, great. So I, I know another thing is, you know, we're here in California, Southern California, so a lot of people know what microgreens are, but what percentage of your you know, showing up at the farmer's market is you educating customers and, and I don't know, do you provide samples to get them to taste it or how do you really let them know how beneficial these microgreens are because still there's a lot of people in America that just don't know the value. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think a lot, of, I think I would argue the vast majority of people don't really know the value of good food in general, you know, not just microgreens. But yeah, like John said before, I do offer samples. That's a great way to get, especially if you're new into microgreens and working maybe a farmer's market growing on your own, the best way to have someone really experience them is to have them try it for themselves. You can always tell them all the benefits, read off a list of the nutrients, but nothing really hits at home with them trying it for themselves. And, oh my gosh, this tastes exactly like broccoli. Well, what I usually say is, well, it's the same seed, same plant, just much younger, the baby, baby version of them. And the way I set up my booth, if anyone wants any tricks, I have a spicy side and a side that's not spicy, I call my nicey. So when people come up, I say, I'm spicy and I got the nicey. You want to try a sample of anything? Let me know. And then we move forward from there. But samples is definitely probably the best way to get people really interested. And you have people who already maybe have a certain inkling, maybe have done sprouting before, that have questions. So it's always good to be, you know, up to date on your on your information and your and maybe some of the scientific studies behind some of the uh, the claims with regards to nutrition too. So, cool. So pre presently, you sell by the ounce. I do. Yeah. And you cut it as needed at to order. So you want to tell us why you you know uh, cut it to order and how much the current selling price as of filming this video, which is subject to change. Very subject to change. Uh, not likely. We'll see. I'm trying to keep people grandfathered in. I don't want to. Uh, uh, be like the Fed and raise interest rates on everyone else. You know, maybe I'll try to eat some of those costs myself. Anyways, um, I do one ounce boxes and also two ounce boxes, and I cut them live because personally that's probably the freshest way you can get them to somebody as opposed to selling to them live. So you can always do prepackaged, but I think John and I are not fans of that because it's hard to maintain the freshness there. So cutting them live at the market in front of the people to see is almost like if you've been to Benihana, it's almost like a show yeah. within the market itself. So it's a good way to really 
get people to see the process of how these actually start to finish, how they end up in this box, how they get to my house, how I eat them. And cutting them in front of people is definitely a good way to really demonstrate that, the, how, the quality and the freshness too. And certain ones like arugula and cress have a really good, a strong aroma. So when you cut them, people can smell them. Like, oh my gosh, I can smell these right here. And that's also when you give them samples, you can have them smell the samples too. It's a really good way to kind of get the senses going and really kind of the visual, the smell, the taste and everything too. So, yeah. Cool. So another question I have is, what's, some, what's, a, what's one of the testimonials that sticks out in your brain of a customer that you had that bought microgreens and it, how it changed their life? Oh, there's been so many. Um, I think one recently that really, uh, I think, hit home for me was I had a family. Um, they've been regulars of mine for probably a few months at this point. And they were coming to me, and one day, um, their daughter, I think, she, I, don't wanna, I don't know her exact age, I think she's in the range of like five to seven, started really eating microgreens. I was really interested. Oh, I kind of, mom, I really want the broccoli. So then I cut her a sample of the broccoli, and she had some, and she said, oh my gosh, mom, this is so good. Can we get a whole box of this? And her mom, you know, just started breaking down into tears because she'd been struggling to get her kids to really ingest or I guess eat more vegetables because the big ones, not that they're bad, but it can be a little bit more off-putting for kids. And tough and just, yeah. yeah, not fun to eat. Not fun to eat. So for kids, it's definitely a really, uh, I guess, an experience that, you know, uh, a testimonial that really hit home for me to see just the direct impact that I could have on somebody's, you know, on someone's day, someone's morning, on their meal. Maybe the next meal they have the microgreens, they'll think about, you know, oh my gosh, that was a great experience, and that John grew these for me, or whoever, not, maybe not just me, or anyone else grows them. It really was a, a heartfelt moment for me to really see that in person, to see that, you know, small things, micro things, microgreens can have big impacts on people's lives, whether it be health, whether it be just overall family dynamics, anything. So I've had a lot of good experiences with the community, that's one that really stuck out as of recently. Wow, and I mean, that's just like changing, uh, you know, a, a child's perception of vegetables from not liking it to now she likes microgreens. Once she starts eating microgreens and like she likes the broccoli, maybe she'll branch out into the cabbage and the arugula and different flavors. Then she'll start getting a taste for the greens and maybe one day she'll be like, oh, I like the microgreens. I want to try the bigger, you know, the, ba the, the adult plants of these too. And then she'll already have a taste for it because the microgreens are so just like, I don't know, they're, they're so intense and flavorful, unlike, you know, the, and not, not so fibrous. I mean, that's the thing, that it's a textured thing, man. The, the microgreens, like I could say, literally melt in your mouth. They don't quite melt in your mouth, but they melt in your mouth a lot more than a big, raw chunk of broccoli that you got <laughs> crunch on. It's not really fun. I don't even like, I mean, I only like my tender broccoli from my garden. I won't even buy broccoli from the farmer's market that's too old and mature, man. I like them young, <laughs> right? Micro young. My, micro, yeah, micro, micro young. young. Yeah, yeah. I want some micro broccoli. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, John. So is there anything else that you want my viewers to know about your farm and growing microgreens today before we sign off? Uh, you guys can find me on social media on Instagram at ho.listic underscore. And um, growing microgreens, I think everyone should do it. You can do it pretty much anywhere. In an apartment, in a garage, on a boat. Yeah. Maybe eventually on the moon or the space station or something, you know, um, anyone and everyone can do it. So if you have a, when there's a will, there's a way. If you have a, a passion for it, go for it. If you have dreams, sprout them and grow for them too. So. Awesome. Awesome words of wisdom. And the other thing I want to say that I didn't mention this whole episode is that microgreens love the same temperature that we do, right? We're here in Southern California, <laughs> this place, so many people live here because the weather is so nice. He grows them without any, for most of the year, without any kind of climate control, right? But if you live in an apartment in New York City, right, and you're heating your apartment in the, you know, winter time, you're cooling it down the summertime, and it's comfortable for you, guess what? It's comfortable for these guys, too, so you can just get a rack and start growing them today, like he's saying. I showed you guys the whole process. You guys could get some bamboo paper towels, get some seeds. We share with you guys where to get them. Get the grow lights, get a rack and start growing them today so you guys can be healthier tomorrow. And if you got kids especially, grow them now and get your kids interested in the microgreens, help let them and teach them how to grow them. They'll start eating them and then hopefully they too will start liking their other vegetables in the future so that they'll be healthier in the long run. All because farmers like John are helping introduce these baby vegetables to all the local people in the area, and you can too if you start growing them today. So check them out 
And it's farmers markets. What farmers markets do you sell at again, John? I do five a week. Redondo Beach on Thursdays, Hermosa Fridays, Saturday Torrance, Sunday Palos Verdes, and Tuesday Becca Torrance. And also I'd like to add another story that you were talking about earlier that made me remember something. Another, I guess, uh, testimonial that really stuck out to me was my Friday market in Hermosa is an evening or afternoon market. And after, after 3 o'clock, all the kids from the school, not all of them, but a lot of them come to the farmer's market. And I've had a few of the parents come by and tell me that my kid asked for a greenhouse for Christmas, and my kid asked for a grow kit for Christmas, my kid asked for just to build a plant, a raised bed planter box for Christmas. So that was another thing that really stood out to me that I just remembered after John was uh, was talking earlier. So Oh, because they got spurred on from trying maca greens yeah. and they're going to the market and seeing fresh food. Yes, exactly. Wonderful. Yeah, so get your kids involved in growing, allow them to pick things out of the garden, help them, help, let them sprout the seeds. Get them involved in the process because when they're involved in the process, you know, they're going to want to participate more and eat the, you know, the products that result from their journey. And I'm sure John knows this, but it's not, there's nothing like eating something that you grew yourself. Exactly. It oh my gosh. It much better. All the love, blood, sweat, and tears that you went into growing that. Finally, you get to eat it. It's an irreplaceable feeling, I'd say. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think my stuff tastes better, but I've had some friends over recently to my garden, they're like, yeah, John, your stuff tastes better, but I think I'm like, you know, prejudiced against my stuff, like, oh, it's like some of the best stuff. I mean, I visit farmer's markets trying to get good quality stuff, and it's like, not as good as the stuff I grow, but whatever, maybe I'll, I'll find a farmer one day at a market that has stuff better than me, and it does happen, rarely, because they're usually one of my viewers that are doing everything I'm telling them. <laughs> John has the greatest videos out there, so. Thanks, man. So yeah, if you want to check out uh, John Ho, I'll put his link to Instagram down below. You can check him out. If you guys enjoy this episode with John, learning about how to grow macarines on a paper towel, hey, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. More importantly, share this with other people so that they can start growing macarines on paper towels. <laughs> Have less mess and easy to do, just a few dollars per tray. You're gonna save yourself lots of money if you guys grow them yourself, or if you want to start a business, you can make lots of money growing microgreens and finding local clientele in your area and selling them as well. Also be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you miss my new and upcoming episodes of coming every five to seven days. You know where to show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. Make sure you click the little bell so you get notified as many of you as fan. And finally be sure to past episodes. The past episodes are a wealth of knowledge. Over 1,700 episodes at this time on this channel dedicated to teach you guys all about how to grow your own food at home <laughs> so you can be more sustainable and eat a lot healthier than the industrial agriculture system will supply it. So with that, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time, and until then, remember, keep on growing.